of my friend, I can only say this. Of all the souls I have encountered in my travels, his was the most human. Hi folks, this is future me popping in before past me starts talking about the local Democratic Party's Christmas dinner. I wanted to give all of you an update on how I'm doing, as well as give my thanks to all of you who've reached out with expressions of sympathy and financial support. I went into work yesterday morning because, well, I would have liked nothing better than to just stay curled up in the fetal position in bed. I'm poor, so I gotta go to work. A number of people at work, including Marv, did do the right thing and ask about Houdini and said that they were sorry when they found out he had died. I guess I should be glad that none of them said anything like, You'll see him again when you get to heaven! Or any of that rainbow bridge treacle. However, I really wanted to be able to look them in the eye and say, Read your Bible. Animals don't have souls. So they don't go to heaven. Which would have probably gotten me fired. Still, he would have felt so good after having to listen to their prayers the day before to be able to drop a little turd in their punch bowl. Emotionally, I still get choked up thinking about Houdini, and it was difficult at times to keep focused on my work and not burst into tears like I wanted to. I took Fuzznuts to the vet this morning to get him his vaccinations, but after asking the doc to give him an examination, they decided that he had some kind of stomach issue and put him on a bunch of antibiotics, so his vaccinations will have to wait until after the first of the year. That was the vet's call, not mine. I'm assuming it's because of the impact on his immune system that the antibiotics can have, and they want to wait for his condition to improve before vaccinating him. I'm not a vet, so I'm not going to question their wisdom on this. I managed to bury Houdini this afternoon, and the hardest part of it was being an old fat guy digging a hole. There was only a light sprinkle of rain, not the downpour I was expecting, so that helped. The funniest thing, for me, however, was that as I was digging the hole, the feral cats in the trailer park were all scattered around, staring at me with what looked like horror on their little faces. Most of them, I should point out, are near clones of Professor Fuzznuts, and Fuzznuts and Houdini never got along. Honestly, the toughest thing for me right now is going to bed. Houdini would oftentimes hop on me after I crawled into bed, march up to my head, grab my scalp with his paws, gently extend his claws in order to tell me not to move, and then proceed to bathe my hair with his tongue thus signaling that he thought of me as a fellow cat, a high honor in the feline world. For all his affectionate snuggling and demands for attention, Fuzznuts has never once licked me. I have owned a number of cats over the years, and as much as I love Fuzznuts, Houdini has a special place in my heart because of that. There are two other cats I've owned who were as unique in their expressions of affection as Houdini was. Both of them were black cats. One was Hecate, a female I got from the pound. She would hop into my lap, wrap her paws around my glasses, and then pull them down my nose and stare into my eyes. The other was Rodan. He had a tiny white line of fur that looked like a necklace across his chest, and the strangest meow of any cat I've ever heard. It sounded like the noise the Japanese rubber monster makes, which is kind of how he got his name. He would generally ignore me, except for when I was watching TV. Then he'd happily hop up in my lap, purring softly while I petted him. The two of them died of anemia-related conditions like Houdini. In Hecate's case, it was feline leukemia. With Rodan, he was fine one day, sick the next, and gone the third. I never even had the chance to get him to the vet, but I could tell that he was anemic on the third day because I recognized how pale he was after having seen Hecate. For those of you out there that have cats, please make sure that they've been vaccinated against feline leukemia and FIP. 
I've watched cats die from both those diseases, and it's not a pleasant way for them to go. The vaccines aren't 100% effective, but they are better than nothing. I don't know what killed Houdini. The vet did a post-mortem test for feline leukemia, and it came back negative, so I don't have to worry about Fuzznuts contracting it by being in the same house as Houdini. And in the near future, I'll be getting Fuzznuts neutered, so his name won't make much sense, but it'll make him more docile, hopefully, and I'll be able to get another cat. I've told myself in the past that I won't get another cat because losing them is so damned painful. But after having owned four black or black and white cats, the place feels empty without having a little house panther around. If I could, I'd be like Hemingway and have hundreds of cats running about the place. But I can't. I will, however, have another black cat and another tuxedo cat like Houdini was. They just make the place, any place, seem like home. And if I manage to find another tuxedo, I'm not going to a breeder, I'll adopt a stray or get one from the pound, I will do the one thing that I always wanted to do with Houdini but never did. Houdini was an almost perfect tuxedo cat in terms of color. He really did look like he was wearing a tuxedo and he had a faint white line on his chin so it appeared that he was smoking a cigarette with a white spot on the tip of his tail. I would look at him and think, I really want to do a reenactment of the putting on the Ritz sequence from Young Frankenstein with him. Whomever that little cat is, if they've got the right coloration, I'll figure out how to train them to meow out something like Ritz! on command. Then I'll get a tux, do the whole routine, and upload it to YouTube. The one thing which Houdini did that I wish I'd been able to capture on video because it was just so goddamned adorable is that when he went to get a drink from his water bowl, he'd do this little dance with his front paws, moving them back and forth as he lapped up water. Okay, so that this intro isn't a total wrist-slitting moment for all the folks out there, and again, I have to thank all of you for your support, both financial and otherwise, Fuzznuts is behaving as one would expect him to, i.e. being a total contrarian to my wishes, so he's clearly in good shape. I also have to apologize that I won't be putting out the Apocrypha episode this weekend as it requires a considerable amount of editing. And as you can imagine, I wasn't up for doing much of anything this past week other than trying to take care of Houdini. I'll try to get that out in the next couple of days. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy my little trip into local politics. Ah, I had a little fun at the party. Greetings, fellow worker slaves, podcasting at 128 kilobits from the Fortress of Squalitude, located just outside the Redneck Mecca. This is the Atheist in the Trailer Park podcast. I'm your host, Tucker. Professor Fuzznuts is in the kitchen having a drink. This is a special episode giving my account of the Sumner County Democratic Party's Christmas party. Boy, that's a little redundant. Anyways, so I went to the party last night. I set out at about 4 p.m. because that's how long approximately it would take me to get there on foot. And yes, it was cold, so I was bundled up nice and warm. And since it gets dark about that time, I had a headlamp strapped to my head, so I looked really fucking goofy. Also had a ski mask on to keep my face warm, and I proceeded to ride my little Razor scooter all the way down to the McMansion, and yes, it absolutely was a McMansion, where the party was held. And now, I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do, because there were far more people there in attendance than I expected. However, not surprisingly, it was overwhelmingly white. And when I say overwhelmingly, there were somewhere be, uh, somewhere over 50 people there. Three of them were 
African American. I didn't see anybody who looked Hispanic or anything else. The um, the catering staff who were treated as guests as well as caterers. So they, you know, it, it was it was not a situation where they were in you know, tuxedos and wearing white gloves and all that. They were African-American, but they were, I mean, they were treated as guests of the party as well, you know, who just happened to be serving food. And it was a, it was a good meal. I will say that it was, it was a lot better than the food I've gotten at some company Christmas parties that I've been to. Anyways, so I get there at the, house in the wealthy, wealthy neighborhood. Um, and as I'm rolling up, I see there's an awful lot of cars there. And people are getting out. And of course, I look like a serial killer in my getup, which is fine. I go up to the door in the house and, uh, you know, knock and woman opens it who she's it's her house along with her husband who's a recently retired podiatrist and you know you can see her eyes just kind of be all nervous because you know there's some weirdo standing in the doorway and I'm a bit taller than her and of course I've got this big aluminum thing in my hands that I'm folding up she probably doesn't know what it is and I peel my mask off and I say I'm Tucker <laughs> and, and this other lady's walking over who's from the one of the executives from the party and she's got big huge fish eyes and they're all they're kind of looking at me and uh, you know the one lady says you're, you know your headlights kind of blinded me and I was like oh I'm sorry I forgot about that I clicked it off because I had forgotten that I had it on <laughs> So I looked really goofy. And I said, I had to walk here. And they were, oh, you could have asked. You could have asked. And we would have gotten your ride. And I'm just like, oh. And I didn't say it, but I was like, oh, no. No, 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 no. That ruins the surprise. You know, that, that wrecks my entrance if somebody gives me a ride in. So, I, uh, you know, I... Uh, slap on the old name tag that they have for everybody and start mingling and it's like wow it's a bunch of old people uh, the uh, I mean the average age was probably around 40 there were a couple of people in their early 20s um, there were there were two teenagers there um, but they were the daughters of one of the women who was at the party so I don't necessarily think they came of their own volition and it quickly became obvious that <clears throat> everybody was definitely middle class. Save for me and one other couple who I got to talking to them a little bit. Um, the guy was a truck driver for a local trucking firm. So he probably may, he makes better money than I do, but he's certainly not middle class, at least in terms of, you know, college educated and things like that. And I didn't quite get to do everything I wanted to do. Um, I didn't get to unsettle as many people as I would have liked, but I did, I did get a, a few comments in to some key people who hopefully took what I was saying seriously. We'll see. Anyways, so, you know, I kind of wander around and chat with a few people. There's, there's not, a, there, uh, the, the thing I noticed about the house, I mean, it's a lovely house, really lovely. Um, but, and, and I will say they weren't, they weren't wretched at me being a horrific looking person because I wore you know, a fairly nice pair of pants, and then I wore a polo shirt that has the logo of a temporary agency emblazoned on it that I got from one of my numerous temp jobs. So, 
we have a, um, you know, they they have, after they decided everybody's got de- gotten there who's going to get there, we have a little gathering in the main part of the house. It, the uh, head of, of the the project, one of the projects that the, D, uh, the local DNC is working on, uh, gave a brief talk about what they're, they've done and what they're doing and what they hope to do. And then we had a prayer. And since I'm an atheist, I didn't bow my head. And I noticed a few other people not bowing their heads. The prayer was given by this elderly gentleman, and it was kind of rambling and incoherent. It was funny, because before he started the prayer, he says... Well, I was, I, I've spent all my life as a Christian. I was a Christian preacher, and that's the only kind of prayer I know how to give, so that's what I'm going to give. And, you know, I hope nobody's offended by it, but if you're offended, don't be offended. Get over it. <laughs> it's like, really? The party of inclusiveness is telling people don't be offended when we do something that many people would consider offensive. That's brilliant. So he gives his long and rambling prayer that just sort of, you know, what the fuck ever. (laughs) I couldn't follow it. I honestly couldn't follow it. (laughs) It just seemed to repeat itself. And then we went and had our dinner and I sat down and then ate and talked to that couple where the husband was a truck driver. And they're, they're talking about moving to another country. Um, getting their passports ready. Apparently, they want to have a passport party with all the Democrats who have passports and are planning to leave. See if that ever comes to pass. And then I started mingling around and got to talk to that guy, like I said, who's head of the projects that the local party's trying to do to get things going. And I brought up to him, I says... You know, I walk everywhere, and he's like, oh, you want sidewalks, mass transit? I says, no, 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 it's not that, it's not that, that's not what I'm going for here. I said, you'll never guess, and he's like, what? I says, and then I did the whole thing about all the the manhole covers and the sewer drains being made in India and telling him, we've got two foundries in town, both of them are capable of doing this. And he's like, uh, that's interesting. I says, you know, why are our tax dollars going outside the country or outside the state or outside the city when we could do it here? And so he seemed to find that interesting. We'll see what happens. Probably nothing. Um, but at least he had the decency to pretend to be interesting, which is more than I can say for my some of my elective representatives. Who could not give three shits about what I have to say. Because I'm not in their party. And I'm poor. The most interesting person, however, I got to talk to was the wife of a professor. He's a music professor at the local community college. She is from Zagreb. And she was one of the people who her head was up during the prayer. So I, you know, I... I, I had wanted to talk to her anyways, but I wasn't going to say, Hey, I did the atheist head check and your head wasn't bowed. And there was one other person I know who was an atheist there because they explicitly said that when they were passing to somebody, passing by somebody. They said something like, Well, you know, even us atheists sometimes celebrate Christmas. Anyways. So, I, you know, her and I get to talking. She's a lovely woman. She's probably around 50 and she she's the thing the thing that got me was she was she was so wanting to be apologetic for the things she was saying and it's like i'm listening to her talk and i'm saying no 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 you don't have to apologize i fully agree with everything she you say she grew up in the former yugoslavia in in zagreb and you know she's talking about she's telling me you know all these things that we're seeing now are the same kinds of things we saw as Yugoslavia was breaking apart. 
she was talking, you know, one of the things that she said is in her country, when she grew up, it was under Tito, who was a, a dictator, but he was a benevolent dictator. He kept the country together and at peace. And she she was saying, you know, in her country, when you, you know, you didn't pay for college, you didn't pay for health care. And she says, you know, how can you be free when you ha- here, when you go to college, you rack up all kinds of debt and you have to take a job, not because you want that job, but because you have to make that kind of money to pay off all this debt, if you can pay off all that debt. She says, you know, and you had the same issue with health care. You, how can you afford to go to the doctor when, when, you know, you're sick? If you, you're paying off debts or, you know, you just, it costs so much. She, and her husband being a state employee has really good health care. And she had, she was talking about how she had some kind of health problem. She didn't really go into the details and I didn't push it, but and she got a prescription for something. And the prescription cost for her after insurance was $100. And she looked at the people in the pharmacy and said, you do understand I have insurance, right? And the people in the pharmacy said, oh, yes, and your insurance saved you $30. Which, you know, I mean, it was it was $100. I'm sure she could easily afford it because her husband, I don't know what she does, but her husband would make fairly decent money. And it's like, she's like, how is that insurance? How does that save you anything when you're still having to spend so much money? And I, you know, I agreed with her compl- completely. And I explained to her about the time I had to go for physical therapy on my arm. And, the, you know, that they said, we want you to go three times a week. And I says, I can't do that unless I know how much it's. this is going to cost me. And they says, well, we can't tell you that because we have to submit the bill to your insurance company, and then they will, you know, tell us what they're going to pay and what you're going to pay. And I says, well, until then, I'm only going to go one time a week. And the next thing I knew, I mean, I went once and then I got laid off from my job. So I no longer had health insurance or the income to pay for it. And then I got the bill and it was $150 after insurance for one visit. If I had gone three times a week, that would have been $450. That was more than I made a week at that time. How, you know, I, there's no way I could pay that. And, you know, doing an installment to pay that shit off, I would have racked up if I went, you know, I don't know how long they would have expected me to to, to go um, to physical therapy. But if I had done that, you know, for, say, a month, that would have been a th- thousands of dollars. <laughs> what, I could pay $10 a month on that at best with what my income was at the time? you got to be fucking shitting me, They're, you know. And, of course, they charge you interest and they do all kinds of other crazy shit because, you know, fuck you. You're a bad person. You owe money. You've got to give it to us. And if you don't give it to us, it's not because you don't have the money. It's because you're a deadbeat who just doesn't want to pay anybody for anything. But her and I gabbed for at least an hour talking about all kinds of different things. Uh, she is really concerned. She said her, she said one thing which I thought was really interesting. And I don't have the perspective that she has on the subject. So I don't. I, I can't comment on the the accuracy of what she was saying, but when she was talking about how, you know, we're in the same situation that Yugoslavia was right before the breakup, she says, you know, things happen slower in your country because it's so big. That may or may not be true. I don't know. But... And, and let's face it, it is just speculation on her part that, you know, we are on the same path as Yugoslavia was right before the breakup. But, you know, there are a lot of things which indicate we are in some serious trouble. I mean, you know, forget the whole 
thing about our election possibly having been sabotaged by the Russians. We are very, very polarized, which is not a good thing. Uh, and that that is what, what happened in Yugoslavia, because, you know, before the breakup, you had Serbs, Croats, Muslims and other groups all living side by side, one another, talking to one another. And then when the country began to break apart, they all began moving into their own enclaves and cutting other people, you know, people from different groups off. Which, you know, is kind of what's happening now. I mean, you have, you know... The coasts on the U.S. largely voted Democratic in the last election, and the middle of the U.S. voted for Republicans. And, you know, even in those those parts of the country where the, you know, they were red states, you had massive pockets of blue in the highly populated areas, just as in places like California, when you got to some of the, you know, the western parts of the, or the eastern parts of the state, and and the more rural parts of the state, those were red. So, you know, it's, you can't make a one-to-one comparison for a variety of reasons, but there's certainly things to be concerned about. We will, of course, find out what's going to happen. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, but I, I will say I did have I did I was able to have a few interesting conversations with people there. Um, generally, they were I mean not generally they were all very nice. I would have liked to have make made more people uncomfortable, but I, like I said, I did get the the. Um, I did get to talk a couple of times with the guy who's ha- heading a bunch of the projects, and he asked me at one point, well, you know, what made me decide to show up and get more involved? And I said, because, uh, you know, the last, uh, you know, under W, I nearly lost everything, and I'm reasonably certain that uh, Trump's going to be a far worse president than W was, so I really don't like the idea of being homeless. But the um, the one thing that gave me hope was that they actually were talking about putting out Democratic candidates in the 2018 election and not simply letting things go the way they have been going. I think this was a good enough wake up, wake up call that they may actually do something this time around. Instead of behaving as they have in the past of sort of apathetic and we don't really think so. They, you know, of course, we'll find out uh, and I will do my best to be at all their little events and bug the shit out of them on things and raise things from my perspective. I will also make sure that um, on those events where there there's going to be alcohol I bring some whiskey because everybody bought wine to this. And oh, there was, well, there was wine. Some asshole bought, brought Yungling beer. And why do I call somebody who brings Yungling beer an asshole? Because the head of Yungling Brewery gave lots and lots of money to Donald Trump and is more than happy to have Trump as president. So <clears throat> if you're... Wanting to boycott companies that support Trump, Yungling Beer is one that you should absolutely boycott. Of course, I don't drink beer, and I've had Yungling once and was not impressed, so <clears throat> screw them. But the other, the only hard liquor anybody brought was some um, Captain Jack's uh, coconut rum, which was okay, but <clears throat> it just doesn't get me in the... Uh, the good kind of mood that whiskey does, so I'd be a little more effective once I've gotten myself lubed up, if you know what I mean. And I will say that they were nice enough to find me a ride home, and I had an interesting conversation with the folks who were taking me home, because the, the one of the, one of the people in the car was um, 
I apparently was was fairly good friends with the um, with some of the heads of the party and was fairly actively involved. So that's uh, so. You know, our, I think some of our discussion will filter back, and of course, you know, they dropped me off in front of my trailer, so they saw that yes, I am not like them. I am somebody who is poor. And I am, <laughs> you know, I, I cared enough about this issue to walk four and a half, five miles in the cold when it was like 30 degrees. That's just below zero Celsius for those of you living in the civilized world. And I did converse with people. Like I said, I, I, I didn't get to cover everything I wanted to do. I wanted to get on them because there are no par- a podcast by any democratic parties that I could find. None. There's there's no part there's no podcast by the National Democratic Party. There's no podcast by this by a state Democratic Party. And, you know, forget Tennessee having one. I mean, California's Democratic Party apparently does not have a podcast from what I've been able to find out. That really needs to happen. Uh, and uh, another thing that, that that gives me hope that's not directly related to this, but there's the um, we had the 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 uh, post mortem of the election for the Democratic Party. They had that in Nashville, so of course I couldn't get to go. And one of the guys who was there actually streamed it from his phone. So. That's important. We've got to get that information out there. And even if it doesn't, you know, nobody watches it, the fact that it hits the web, it adds a data point to the search engine. So somebody searching on things for the Democratic Party who happens to be in Tennessee, that's more likely to get kicked towards them than not. And that will hopefully wake people up. I mean, they had... According to the guy who, like I said, his name is Lentz, um, and I didn't really catch exactly what he his job is, but he's, like I said, he's in charge of certain special projects that they're doing to try to increase membership in the party and get awareness going. He um, he says he said that there were twenty thousand people approximately who voted for Hillary Clinton in the county. That's approximately one eighth of the population of the county. So, and if you figure that out of that population, you know, 50% of them are too young to vote, then you've got a good, you know, that, 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 (laughs) that increases the margins of, um, people because, and I don't know what percentage of the county voted, but I'm sure it's smaller than, half the eligible population. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, But they do recognize some of the problems. I was listening to this one lady speaking who, she's in her 60s or so, and she was talking about how she worked a phone bank for Hillary... I don't remember if she said it was during the primary or during the election, but she said that they, you know, the list of names they gave her was uh, for, you know, had people on it. Most of them were over the age of 65. And she's like, we've got to get younger people involved, which is very, very true. But, and I'm going to be snarky here because I know that's what you want to hear. Um, and it's true. So, the, one of the things about the party was, you know, it, 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 you know, it was held in the McMansion, and we had they had things set up in the uh, the breakfast nook for people to sit and eat. They had things set up in the dining room for people to sit and eat, and they had things set up in the attached garage for people to sit and eat. The thing I noticed about the attached garage was uh, it had carpeting. And this wasn't carpeting specially put down for the, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, the dinner. This was always in there. <laughs> so, 
you know, that just kind of says something when your car is parked on carpet. And um, they had the the um, the other thing that the garage had. It didn't. It appeared to have a kitchen in it. It was. I don't think there was an actual sink or anything like, or a stove or anything like that. But it was definitely set up that way with you know built-in cabinets and a nook, and that's where the the catering was set up was there. But it was a three-car garage, had two refrigerators in it. Really? And, um, I mean, this, the, the, the couple that owned the house, they were both, you know, I mean, he was retired and she was a few years younger than him and I guess was his second wife. I don't know. Um, they, because, you know, she talked about her kids being somewhere and his kids being somewhere else. And, you know, not them not disparaging them on that but you know the point is the kids were all old enough and grown and not longer living in the house so why the hell did they need three refrigerators because <laughs> they had two in the garage one in the kitchen um the the kitchen had two ovens two built-in ovens um had a get ga- uh, a five burner gas stove with a uh water faucet above the stove so you know you can fill your pans while you're cooking and you don't have to turn around, walk around the island in the middle of the kitchen and go to the sink to get it. Um, they had a very nice dishwasher. Um, a, and they, I get, maybe it was a trash compactor. I don't know. It was some kind of fancy thing that looked, that was the size of a dishwasher, but it wasn't the dishwasher. I didn't get a good enough look at it. I just noticed, wait, there's two. Maybe they did have two dishwashers. I don't know. Um, and I'm not. I'm not smacking him for you know having a nice house, uh, because after all, he's a doctor, so he earned the money. And apparently, whatever she did before, uh, you know, or maybe still does. I didn't. I didn't find out what her profession was, but you know, she owned the house, I guess, or had bought the land and then he built the house. Um, but you know, she obviously wasn't hurting for money either. So she had a good source of income, whatever her job was. And I don't disparage them for that. It's just that, you know, a lot of people who are poor would feel really uncomfortable in a place like that. Whereas if it was held, say, in a uh, banquet hall that they'd rented out or a restaurant that they'd rented out, people would feel more comfortable who, because they wouldn't be exposed to folks who, mm, well, let's face it, can't understand what it's like to find $4 in your wallet and think, oh, thank God I can eat today, as many poor folks do. And that one of the things I brought up on the way home, I said, well, you know, it's mostly white people there. We've got to have, you know, a more diverse group. And the, the people who gave me the ride home agreed, and they said this year there weren't as many, it wasn't as diverse as it has been in past years. I'll, I'll take their word for it. I don't know. And they said, they said, you know, we need to, we we definitely do need to do a better outreach. And I and th- at this point we were in the pulling into the trailer park, and I pointed, you know, I gestured around. I says, all you know, almost all my neighbors are Latino, so they're prime candidates for the Democrats. And I don't, I know, I, I, you know, I don't think anybody knocked on their doors and talked to them. I don't know what percentage of my Latino neighbors are immigrants and what percentage of them are from Puerto Rico. I, I don't know. I, I had one neighbor. I don't know if it's still the same one or not. I don't interact with them very much because their English is, is poor. My Spanish is terrible. And, uh, I, you know, I just, I'm a bit of an isolationist kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> but I, one, at least one of my neighbors I know was from Puerto Rico. But, you know, I, I'm not going to say that none of the people around me are... I, I'm not going to, you know, make any claims about the citizenship of any people around me. I don't know what their status is. I don't frankly care if they're here legally or illegally or not. They're, you know, they're decent human beings, so why the fuck should I care? 
about their legal status. They, you know, they, they, they live their lives. They do what they, you know, ha- do and don't bother anybody. So why the fuck should I care if they're here legally or not? They, they're obviously contributing to our country. So fucking A, let's have them here. But, you know, if they're eligible to vote, we need to get, the, the Democrats need to get to them and get them to be able to vote. Because uh, we've got to make th- we've got to turn things around. I, I mean, I don't know if we can flip the you know uh, state house or anything like that. But if we can just n- if we can turn this city blue, or at least nibble away at some of the power the Republicans have in this state, we'll be a lot better off. And God, I mean, we have we have got to do some shit because. The Republicans now control the Senate by, f- they have 52 seats in the Senate, and the Democrats have 48, so it's not a super majority, but in 2018, if the Republicans end up with 60 seats in the Senate, we're fucked. We are fucked. And who knows how the House is going to go in 2018. So, anyways, I've rambled on long enough. I've got more shit to do. But I hope you enjoyed this, and I will keep everybody posted on things, because I am certainly going to try to be as disruptive as I can and get these people moving faster and doing more than what they plan on doing. Not because I think they're doing the wrong things, but because I this is a situation based on what Eric Hoffer said in his The True Believer, um, we need to go for broke. If we go for broke, we may get something. If we continue on a slightly conservative path, conservative is in not taking a lot of risks, not politically conservative, we are doomed. But if we push hard, we may get somewhere. We certainly don't have much choice. That's it for this episode of The Atheist in the Trailer Park Podcast. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, as well as just about anywhere else podcasts can be found. Many of the episodes are also on YouTube. Follow the show on Twitter. At T Park Atheist is the show's Twitter handle. It's on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash trailerparkatheist.com. If you happen to like the podcast, please rate it on iTunes. If you'd like to support the podcast, there's a donate button on the show notes page. You can support it via Patreon at patreon.com forward slash TN Tucker. Thanks for listening. Say goodnight, Fuzznuts. All I know is this violates every canon of respectable broadcasting. Damned cat.